Hedgehog mating ritual. Of course, of course. Not like I have any other places to be. You guys have been doing this for over 20 years now. Come on, just get it over with. started I just want to say that I absolutely called Sonic and Shadow Generations about a year ago in my Frontiers video. Trust to bring us new stories and adventures for these characters and to take us to even further horizons. At least until they pivot and make Shadow the Hedgehog too. Yeah, that's right. I'm the reason you have your shipping game. You're welcome, Sonato fans. Every franchise has its crowning moments, media that stands above all the others as the best of the best. When people think about that series, be it a movie, a video game, whatever, it has that specific part that people remember. Star Wars has Empire Strikes Back, uh, The Lord of the Rings has The Two Towers, Final Fantasy has Final Fantasy VII, and of course Mario World is the best of the original Mario games, and Mario 3 is just okay at best. Disclaimer, the piece of media in any franchise you like the best is completely subjective. Whichever one you think is the best is the best. Yes, you watching the video, your opinion is the most important of all and everyone else is wrong. But ever since my video on Sonic Adventure 1 what feels like a century ago now, I've thought about its sequel. To say that both games got an insane amount of runtime on my GameCube back in the day is an understatement. I'd go back and forth between both, replaying the story over and over, or at least as far as I could get as a dumb kid, and obsessing over them. And clearly it wasn't just me. I think Adventure 2 has had a huge impact on a lot of people, even those that haven't actually played the game. How many of you out there know, like, the lyrics to City Escape by heart? Who doesn't know about the infamous Sonic and Shadow tandem jorking it so they can get their super forms at the end of the game? And of course there's the, uh... Shit, how do I say this without getting in trouble on YouTube? Um, the scene of an average-aged Fortnite player getting Victory Royale. Does that work? I'm not getting in trouble. That, that works? Okay, cool. Also, an old man just, like, gets killed by a firing squad after vowing to uh, kill the entire planet, so, you know, fun game for kids. Point is, Sonic Adventure 2 has sort of seeped into the general gaming consciousness. Who wouldn't scream their lungs out at Live and Learn at the Sonic Symphony? The absolute Shakespearean scene of the faker yell in the jungle. I mean, the game's got it all. So much of Sonic's identity can be traced back here to the point where it's a little crazy looking back all these years later. And yet, even with all that influence, all that fame and reverence, there are times where it feels like Sonic just never moved on. Or at least, the general appeal around the series never moved on, if that makes any sense. I'm certainly not about to say that Adventure 2 is overrated or underrated or anything like that. I think it's too hyperbolic of a statement to say about any game. But it's worth talking about the ways that Adventure 2 influenced the series going forward, for better or for worse. It's a game that I love, it's a game that many people love for good reason. But it's also used as this shining pillar of what Sonic should be, instead of what it could grow from. It's a phenomenon I've noticed with many franchises out there. A feeling of trying to relive those glory days, to remember what made something good, instead of trying to find new avenues to explore. The Sonic series has been a target of this for a good while now, with any number of Green Hill, Chemical Plant, Nostalgia Rush revamps in the recent years. But there was a time when this wasn't the case. There was a time where finding out that you could unlock Green Hill Zone in Sonic Adventure 2 was this cool, amazing, legendary thing. Finding out that someone had unlocked Metal Sonic in Adventure 1 was this badass revelation. And you know what? On paper, it still is, but the, the crushing realization that it's basically just a skin kind of dampers the, the coolness down a little bit. I mean, it's still cool, don't get me wrong, but... Eh. I mentioned it as a joke at the beginning, but there has been this resurgence of reverence for Shadow and Sonic Adventure 2. Between using the logo and the general story for the third movie, to using Shadow and Sonic dashing past each other touching quills for Shadow Generations, People were literally making jokes about Maria getting Robloxed on Twitter the moment her actress was revealed for the third movie. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, it's me. I'm people. Go follow me there if you want, wink wink. Unlike Adventure 1, I never felt like I got the full experience of Adventure 2 when I was a kid. I would often beat the story mode and then just put the game down, never to really look at it again outside of replaying a few levels. 
And when you beat the game with only 30 or so emblems, only to find out there's like 150 or so left, it's a big game. I never earned the reward of Green Hill Zone. And realizing that, seeing all this reference and reverence to Adventure 2, it made me want to give the game a thorough look. I wanted to see how Adventure 2's legacy has impacted the rest of the series going forward, good and bad, and see the full picture of a game that I've loved for a long, long time. This game means a lot to me, and I think it means a lot to people that grew up in the same time I did. It's a game that, when you talk about the best Sonic games of all time, is one of the contenders for, like, number one, if not number two. And I wanted to take a look at why that is. If it has this much reverence, this much nostalgia for it, it has to be for a reason, right? Look, this, this is this is Guard from the future after I've done everything. This took a lot out of me. This one, this one was tough, like, all around, like... Just subscribe, be nice. Uh, each subscription gives me an extra ring to stay alive alone. I don't know. I don't have a joke anymore. Just help me out. This one was tough. It doesn't feel like it was all that long ago when I was a kid walking around with my grandma in Toys R Us seeing a big poster for Sonic Adventure 2. Seeing that iconic, original Dreamcast cover with Sonic and Shadow back to back, that double spined logo. I was immediately in love, begging my grandma to buy it for me on the spot. Even back then, dumb baby brained boy that I was, I had enough sense to see that this was the new hotness. This idea of an evil Sonic with his awesome black and red color scheme, seeing and hearing that you could play as the villain character, god I miss those days. Back in my day when we didn't have to worry about horse armor and battle passes. Oh god, I'm getting old. If I want to be a crusty 20 to 30 something, Shadow's creation was absolutely just a ploy to get more eyes on the series. It's the same thing for a lot of shows that do the main character but evil type trope or something along those lines. You know Poochie from The Simpsons? Like that, like that kind of character. But man, if they didn't make the coolest goddamn Poochie in the world. I know a lot of people who are still obsessed with Shadow the Hedgehog to this day. He is their messiah, their aesthetic, if you will. And I totally understand because while I do like Sonic, he is a little bit... Sonic. But Shadow, he's got that unrestrained edge, you know what I mean? Like, he is the Vegeta to the Goku, deliberately so. And fuck if it doesn't work. Though, <laughs> I've always been more partial to Rouge myself. If you ask me what Sonic Adventure 2's biggest strength was, it was making each character feel important. Coming from Sonic Adventure 1, where there were stories that barely mattered, that purposeful switch to only two stories with interchanging gameplay was brilliant. It still allowed Sonic Team to test different gameplay styles and characters without having to try and come up with stories for each one. I can see the arguments that the story in Adventure 2 is bad or nonsensical, but I don't think that necessarily matters. Whether or not it's the next great American novel isn't as important as the impact it has on the player. Of course, with hindsight, we can call certain story beats stupid or emotionally manipulative, but I don't think that takes away from how fun it feels. But even Sonic Team wanted to use this sequel as an opportunity to expand on their storytelling. Adventure 1's story spread the details and important moments between six different viewpoints, leading to a disjointed and frustrating experience. But here, it feels like the devs really wanted to create a deeper and more exciting story for all the characters at once. Is it stupid and contrived that the entire world, Amy included by the way, suddenly is mistaking Sonic for this black furred hedgehog? I'm the colorblind one and even I think this is fucking dumb. But at the same time, do I think the chaos control scene with Sonic and Shadow at the start of the game is absolute peak fiction? Fuck yeah it is. The rule of cool is on full display in Adventure 2. While Adventure 1 was more subdued and grounded with its storytelling, the second one pulls out all the damn stops. And I think that's for the best. While it started back in the original 2D games with Super Sonic, time travel, fighting Robotnik in space, Adventure 2 is the first game where it really feels like it's leaning into anime influences. I'm certainly not about to defend some of the voice acting as it goes off into a little bit of the uh... 
so bad it's bad territory. Everyone's trying their best to help out, and so must I. But you know what? The game just goes for it in ways that I think work far more than it doesn't. Each character gets center stage, at least temporarily, and makes them the star of the show. From Tails getting to take down Eggman on his own, to Rouge being to revealed to be a government agent, hell, even a non-player character like Amy gets time to have an impact on the story. Even if it's a little forced. Look, I, I didn't say it was perfect, alright? I just like it. While it's schlocky and silly, it never feels forced. All the moments in the story feel honest and earnest, fully buying into its own coolness. Sonic's introduction at the beginning of the game is cheesy as fuck, and I'll never tell you that it's not. But it's also the coolest fucking thing ever. Watching Sonic break out of custody and dive off a helicopter with a piece of scrap metal, leading to him using it as a snowboard down the streets of not San Francisco? If you don't find that cool, I mean, I don't know, learn to stomach some cringe, I guess. The story is a big selling point for Adventure 2, and honestly, that would be the case for a lot of the games going forward. Both fans of the series and the creators of the games would slowly become more and more invested in this world, in the complicated character motives, in the setting, in the larger-than-life plots. Everything Sonic would become later in this franchise starts here, especially when it comes to the story. For better or for worse, Princess Elise kisses those rigor mortis hog lips in its Sonic 06 because of how this game was received. And honestly, I'm sorry to like the actual Sonic fans in the audience because, listen, I know we're all tired of the Sonic 06 jokes, it's almost been 20 years, I get it. It's just, I get it. I know in later years a lot of people kind of got sick of Sonic and his stupid friends constantly forcing everyone and anyone into the narrative. Heroes and Shadow the Hedgehog created a lot of friction having a dozen other colorful annoyances running around with you. I'm not the world's biggest Charmy the Bee hater out there, but I know a lot of people knock at least 10 points off the score the moment he opens his mouth. Whee! Shadow and Rouge are like the best additions to the roster in the whole franchise. I couldn't put my finger on why I liked Shadow so much in this game, at least his design, but I think I finally understood. He has like blue and purple highlights along his fur so he's not just completely pitch black, and he reminds me of the black suit from Spider-Man stories. And like, I kind of wish they would have kept that design going forward, I don't know how they would have done it in more HD designs, but I don't know, something along those lines just gives him some more depth. I think a lot of longtime Sonic fans would agree that Shadow's story is one of the highlights of the whole series. While T'Kal and Chaos' story was tragic, it was hard to connect to the characters that we don't really interact with. The player gets flashbacks to T'Kal's time and interacts with her in a sense, but it never does enough to give any character proper reasons to be invested or interested. Shadow does the idea of events that happened in the past having long-lasting repercussions way better here. From the idea of Eggman idolizing his grandfather only to find out that he was a raging psychopath, to understanding that Shadow's entire desire was one warped and twisted by decades of seething hatred, there's a lot of depth that you wouldn't expect from a lot of games with funny cartoon rats running around. But I think Adventure 2 finds the perfect balance between necessity and fluff. Amy, while a playable character in Adventure 1, was a side story until they crossed over with other stories. And while I would have liked to have seen where they could have evolved her gameplay, I don't necessarily mind trimming the fat if it means a more streamlined experience. Despite having the same number of playable characters as Adventure 1, it never feels bloated or cumbersome. Both stories continue at a brisk pace and it never feels like there's much wasted time going from point A to point B. There are some moments that drag, like the three stages and a boss dedicated to getting into Eggman's base, but largely every single stage progresses the narrative forward in a satisfying way. Maybe it's just the nostalgia goggles blinding me, but I think Adventure 2 has some of the best and most iconic levels in the entire franchise. Every Sonic and Shadow level, Pumpkin Hill, Aquatic Mine, Security Hall, both of the treasure hunting space stages, all of these levels have so much fun elements to them that I thought I might forget some, but no, I remember almost every single level in this game for just how fun they are. A stage in Sonic Adventure 2 is the whole package. Amazing visuals that still hold up pretty decently today with an even better soundtrack. I seriously couldn't get enough of listening to every single stage theme. But Knuckles and Rouge levels are the standout. The just the, the chill music in each one of those stages is so good. I think there's something to be said about the way that these levels are presented. One of my biggest gripes about Sonic Adventure 1 was that, outside of Sonic, most of the levels were kind of retrofitted from his story to work with one of his friends' stories. 
But here, while most levels share occasional aesthetics and sometimes some actual level layouts, they still feel perfectly tailored to that specific character. I know that the level design for Sonic games tends to be a point of contention for a lot of people that believe that you have to go fast the moment that the stage opens, but I've always been a firm believer that Sonic games work best when you earn that speed, learning the best route through a stage and getting there the fastest. And it's rewarding to pull off, at least in a tightly designed level, finding all the shortcuts and paths to get an A rank. With the introduction of the ranking system, it adds a whole extra layer of skill needed to progress, at least when it comes to completion. It's not just a matter of getting to the end of stages anymore, you gotta be optimal. It's not without its caveats, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. I think Adventure 2's level design is some of the best in the series, and that's not just the nostalgia talking. Sonic and Shadow Stages are some of the most tightly designed, giving you just enough wiggle room to find your own path while funneling you through tricky and satisfying platforming. Speed above all is the mantra for their stages to be sure, but speed alone doesn't get you that coveted A rank. Sometimes you have to know where and when to go after a group of enemies or what route will give you extra points for doing a special trick. City Escape is probably one of the best introductions to a game, bar none. Like, it's one of those easy to learn but difficult to master type levels. There's not a lot of challenge between you and rushing to the end of the stage. There's some death pits and a few enemies in places here and there, but it's a really cozy ride just to kind of ease you into the feel of the game. At the same time, it organically shows the players a lot of the game's mechanics. You need to use the somersault to get through these boxes, or there's a lot of grind rails down winding staircases that let you test the grinding system. This stage does a lot to show the players the game's systems, so much so that it's almost hard to figure out how to explain them all without being mind-numbing. There's a reason that players remember this stage beyond just the banger level theme. It's just an amazingly well-designed level all around. Each stage afterwards gradually introduces more and more difficult elements. Metal Harbor has a lot more insta-death pits, but it helps you learn how to do the light speed dash and use your homing attack to chain across pits. Green Forest and Pyramid Cape help you learn to keep your speed up while dealing with obstacles in your path and finding more score opportunities. Whichever dev at Sonic Team decided to put these fucking ghosts on the second time door sprint, there's a special gift on its way to your house. It's the funny meme piss beam. Suffer. It all culminates in a final challenge with Final Rush, a stage nearly all death pits and grind rails, applying everything you've learned and testing you. I don't think every stage is perfect, but the progression of difficulty never felt unfair or unearned. There's a clear path from the ease and carefree feeling of City Escape to the difficult but rewarding pathing through Final Rush. Oh, and uh, uh, Crazy Gadget is in there somewhere, but fuck gravity mechanics. I'll always die on the hill that I think the treasure hunting stages in both the adventure games are great. I loved playing as Knuckles in the classic games, and especially in Mania and Superstars, but I've also always felt that the treasure hunting stages were a good evolution of his gameplay. It's not perfect, but I think there's a lot more good than bad. Giving him this foil of a professional jewel thief is a great idea, and it pits him up against someone who goes against his ideals. While he might not necessarily be evil, it gives the both of them a great dynamic that I think tends to get overlooked at times. At least, um, outside of certain fan art. <clears throat> uh, moving on. Treasure hunting stages follow that similar level of ramping difficulty like the speed stages, but they teach you wholly different skills. Speed is still a factor, but it's more about learning the layout of the stage and figuring out the fastest route to search around for the treasure. While speed stages are more linear roller coasters, Knuckles and Rouge stages are like a compact hide-and-seek game. Each stage is densely populated with various obstacles and unique attributes to help familiarize yourself with the location. It's the reason why stages like Pumpkin Hill have distinct mountains, or why Mad Space has a uh, shitty level layout. They start out smaller, with Rock Canyon and Dry Lagoon being tiny in comparison to later stages, but gradually they become larger, with more complex locations for treasures. While poor Knuckles had a concussion between games that can only sense one treasure at a time now, none of the levels are so complex that you can't do a quick sweep around most of them. Even some of the more complex ones, like Death Chamber, once you know all the different maze-like paths, you can sort of get around pretty quick. Some of the stages have some bullshit gimmicks, like Rouge thinking she's hot shit and forcing a five minute time limit on one of the most obnoxious levels in the game. But the point is, I think that while the levels aren't as iconic as the speed stages, they've done enough to earn their place in this game and sort of 
make this game more well-rounded. Also, the uh, reveal that Rouge was a spy the whole time broke my little baby pea brain when I was a kid, so how could you hate him? I think that there's enough good story and character moments that I'd miss them if the hunt stages weren't in the game. But uh, enough about all that dumb shit. It's time to go shoot some guns. Yeah! If you watch my older video on Sonic Adventure 1, first of all, I'm, I'm so sorry. There are triple A multi-million dollar games today that do not show this level of sheer terror that Sega achieved in the 10 months it took to make this. It's only been like a year since I've made this and who the fuck are you? But also, you'll know I have an unhealthy love for Gamma, the playable Eggman robot. He had some of the guiltiest pleasure fun stages and one of the most heart-wrenching stories in that game. And while I'm glad they continued to create deep and sad stories with Adventure 2, I'm equally happy that they kept his shooting gallery stages as well. While in some ways it feels weird giving Tails a mech and shooting mechanics, it sort of makes some sense. You guys remember his solo game Tails Adventure when he used literal napalm on an army of birds, right? Good time. Th that's real, by the way. That is a real video game. Please, like, uh, go fact check me. That's real. But also it follows the established storyline from Adventure 1 with him tinkering more with his planes and making more complex machines. The tornado being able to transform into the cyclone while being a great pun makes total sense for Tails. It set him up directly against his rival Eggman, pitting them machine against machine instead of small fox boy against uh, robot ankles. This man has attempted to take over the planet multiple times with a large nation's worth of armies. Why did he put the fucking weak spot of his robot on the ankles? I don't, I don't understand. While it's unfortunate that they kept the tinnitus beam from Gamma, the stages built for Tails and Eggman feel a lot more well thought out. It's all about chaining combos and getting higher scores, but you still have to get to the end in a timely manner, so you kind of have to balance the two. Except for a uh, cosmic wall. The timed mission for that level is still like eight minutes long. What the fuck were they thinking? Mech stages follow the same philosophy of getting better at blasting the more that you play. It's not like you need to do a lot of routing like the speed and hunt stages. Everything is pretty linear through the whole stage. The most you really need to learn is where all the enemy placements are so you can kind of combo better and get a higher score. Then again, you can get like an A rank on every single one of the non like special missions just by barreling down the corridor like a gorilla with a Gatling gun. In general, if we talk about the games in the non boost era, I've always thought that Adventure 2 was the most fun to play. Maybe not the best controlling, but there was always something that made me want to come back over and over. I rarely tried to do the extra missions on each stage as a kid, but I would play the base missions over and over just because of how much fun I would have. And even playing it now, even purposely trying to fight all of my nostalgia, I get that exact same joy. I feel like I've been playing a whole new game for the first time, or I feel like I found a long lost expansion that I never knew existed. Hundreds of new missions to take on in the stages that I love and playing as the characters that I've come to grow so attached to. Not every single mission on every single stage is a hit. Some of the stage missions fit way more than others, while some keep me up at night. Delving into a majority of these new missions felt like a breath of fresh air for this game. When I had gone through just like a couple hour session grinding out some of the emblems, I had already found myself wanting to boot the game back up right after I just stopped. This is a cry for help. Sonic the Hedgehog has me captured and he won't let me go. Someone please lace his chili dog with rat poison, please! Every single stage in the game has five missions. Missions. Yeah, missions. Every single stage in the game has five missions, each with its own emblem to collect from completing it. You'll always get the first emblem just for playing the story, meaning there's another four to finish getting from the stage select. And I always knew these extra missions were there, but it never really dawned on me how much there really was to do when taking on this task. When you start to go stage by stage, completing each mission in order, it can start to feel a little daunting, like you're working on a checklist. But I think that checklist feeling went away once I started to get a feel for how the game asked me to interact with it. Ignoring the driving stages, each of the five missions is always the same across the whole game. Mission 1 will always be the story mission, then the 100 ring challenge, the lost chow, the time attack, and then the hard mode. Every single level, including the final stage, has each one of these missions in that exact same order. To certainly, uh, mixed uh, results. Don't cry about the 100 ring challenges, 
cry about the 100 ring challenges. Don't cry about the 100 ring challenges. This is the good section. Don't cry about the 100 ring challenges. Ah! On paper, I really like all these different missions. There's enough variety that it forces you to kind of look at all the stages in different ways every time you go through them. Going through City Escape for the time attack will give you different skills than when you have to go through it looking for as many rings as you can as fast as you can. And it's like, I think that's the way that a Sonic game should use its replayability. Give you the same levels, but sort of force you to look at them in different ways. Explore different paths you might not have seen just by blasting through it. The idea of doing Metal Harbor five times sounds like shit, but the team game is quickly broken up by having different endpoints and obstacles. Going for all A ranks finally made me learn how to get to the top of the rocket after all these years, so this whole endeavor was worth it for that alone. I think my therapist will believe me if I say that. She's getting worried every time I cringe hearing the words Final Rush Hard Mode. Missions fit a stage on a case-by-case -case basis, with no one stage really fitting all five missions, save for like, the first couple per story. Once you get beyond that halfway point for each side, the missions become harder and harder to properly fit in in some instances. I'll go into it a bit deeper later, but things like the 100 ring challenges and the time attacks make hunt stages and shooting stages feel a lot worse. In some ways, these missions help build up your skills as you can very easily take things that you've learned in previous missions into a different one. My first couple attempts at doing City Escape and Radical Highway felt very different than my last few attempts playing Final Rush and Chase. Even if those stages are kind of a nightmare to try and perfect, I felt like I had all the skills that I needed. When people kind of look at the legacy of Sonic Adventure 2, I think that there's a lot that people don't give it enough credit for. Some of the smaller things like, oh, now the light speed dash is just one button and you go. Or the way that characters like Tails and Knuckles would be characterized for the like, rest of the franchise. A game as recent as Sonic Frontiers uses these multi-tiered objectives in its levels just like Adventure 2 does. And I mean, like, we all know these are called soap shoes, but soap isn't even a brand anymore. Like... They've outlived the soap shoes. These are just the Sonic Adventure 2 shoes now in most of the games they're in. Did you know there actually is like a brand of shoe that still does the soap type thing? Like, you too can be your cool 2001 self just like Sonic the Hedgehog and grind down the rails at your local park. I'm not buying them. I'm not getting them for the bit. I'm not breaking my fucking spine for comedy. Of course, a game's legacy isn't all sunshine and rainbows. While we might want to convince ourselves that any one game that we love is perfect in every sense of the word, sometimes we have to take another long, long look to see some of those blemishes. The horrible, disgusting, chili-soaked blemishes. But if you want to see those, you'll have to follow me to the Space Colony Ark. Easy peasy. I'm evil now. I think it's always hard to come back to a game with any level of reverence. You never want to contend with the fact that something might not be as good or as fun as you thought it was. And while I'm not about to pretend that I ever thought Adventure 2 was perfect, I felt more conflicted writing this script than I have any other video. I started making videos with Adventure 1 and found that my nostalgia had blinded me to what I loved about that game. Finding out that I only liked about a third of it was eye-opening, but it still didn't make me hate it. And I'm not about to have some revelation like, oh, actually Adventure 2 was shit all along, take that Twitter. I still love this game, genuinely from the bottom of my heart, but so much of it has me going back and forth on what I like. Taking a deeper look at the game, much deeper than I had with Adventure 1, it was clear to me what the strengths of the game were. While many of the things I would consider nitpicks didn't bother me from a surface level, so many little annoyances began to pile on level after level as I attempted to finally get that 100% reward. You ever play like an online game with one of your really aggro friends, and when they start getting fucked up they blame like the lag or the game's mechanics or literally anything else? That's kind of how I feel about Adventure 2 at times, but like, actually justified? Hey, ah, ah. I see you picking up that skill issue stamp. Put that shit down right now because I'm telling you, it's a lot more nuanced than a game just being good or a game just being bad. While Adventure 2 would contribute a lot to the series' identity and style going forward, 
I think it would also set the standard for a lot of less than savory practices for Sonic Team and Sega. Buckle up, we're gonna be talking about some really boring behind the scenes jargon. Way, way back in the ancient year of 1999, a small group of developers formed out in San Francisco known as Sonic Team USA. Originally tasked with the localization of Sonic Adventure 1, they, along with the game's director Takashi Azuka, eventually shifted focus to a sequel. But with the shift in location, as well as a shift in design for the sequel itself, came some... interesting changes to the development team. Izuka has gone on record stating that the team for Adventure 1 was around 50 or so in total, but the follow-up would instead have a development team of around 11 for a majority of the 18 months that the game was worked on. And while this isn't something to decry the game for, like I said, Adventure 2 is exceedingly fun, it's something worth noting when looking forward. Time and again, we'd see Sega continually understaff and underfund games in the Sonic franchise, even up until recently. Sonic Frontiers, for the base game, had a total of 60 members working on it. For those of you keeping score at home, yes, that does mean that Frontiers barely had a bigger dev team than Sonic Adventure back in 1999. And I love Sonic Frontiers, but it makes it really clear where that lack of polish was coming from when you consider Sega's very abusive relationship with their own hog. While I wouldn't necessarily say that Sonic put Sega on the map as they had been involved in the arcade and software market for a long time, I also don't think it's a stretch to say that Sonic is what kind of put them into a household name. And it's like, even if he's not your preferred mascot of choice, it's hard to ignore how big of a giant and how much he still is a mascot of the gaming industry. The fact that he remained relevant for so long, despite the almost negligent treatment from Sega, is shocking to say the least. I certainly don't have evidence to prove this, and I would never try to imply otherwise, but it almost feels like Sega began to expect that Sonic games only needed a minuscule team to work on them, as small as possible. Remember when they split Sonic 06's dev team in half, but kept the same release date for some reason? That's the kind of mindset seemingly spawned from this miracle of development. The fact that Sonic Adventure 2 wasn't seen as some homunculus of a project and treated like gospel is fucking bananas. Again, no concrete evidence, but it's hard not to follow the proverbial corkboard lines here. So considering that minuscule team and fairly short turnaround, it's not surprising that there are a lot of little problems from a fundamental level in spots. It's nothing so egregious that I'd say the game is unplayable, far from it. A lot of the shit you see online trying to make the game seem worse tends to ham it up for the camera. And hey, more power to them, get that bag I guess. But I don't think being that hyperbolic lends itself to discussing the actual issues present in the game. There's enough to bring up as problematic that you don't have to resort to faking how bad the grinding mechanics are, or purposely ignoring mechanics for the sake of a quick joke. A lot of the inherent issues with the game come from the physics, or lack thereof. I've never played a game that feels quite like the most fun and precise platformer I've ever played to the most bottom-of-the-barrel one-man indie slop on Steam in the exact same level. Am I the one being a little hyperbolic? Yeah, and I'm willing to admit that, but I'm also willing to admit that there's a lot of points in the game where it just doesn't function. Points where the homing attack just completely ignores the target right in front of you, or missions that are just way too fucking hard to complete for no reason. There's so many little annoying, gnawing frustrations that compound over time that eventually they make Big the Cat look like he's been on a diet for 20 years. I know a lot of people like to argue that Sonic games play themselves, and there are a lot that certainly do. Levels and mechanisms that completely automate your gameplay and barely let you make any sort of platforming decisions. And in some ways that's true for Adventure 2, with a lot of levels having automated moments and obstacles that you don't really have control over. But to me, automation has never been the issue in and of itself. To me, the issue comes when you try to fight that automation for control after it's over. That feeling of coming out of a loop when you're holding the stick one way, only for Sonic to come and jerk- oh my god. <laughs> that feeling of coming out of a loop when you're holding the stick one way, only for Sonic to jerk in a different direction because of the camera. It would even happen in the old games too, where Sonic would skid to a halt after automation because the stick position was technically in the opposite direction now. It's especially deadly to go against the automation in a lot of places in Adventure 2. 
Pushing just a little too far on the half pipe in green jungle or white forest? Well, that's about to be one waterlogged hog. Trying to do too many tricky jumps off of grind whale, whale, grind whales? Trying to do too many tricky jumps off of grind rails or fight against gravity in final rush and chase? Well, at least you'll take a small town out with you when you breach orbit. Trying to go fast and use shortcuts to get to the end feels bad when the physics fights against you. Not being able to jump off rails means that an A rank is probably just dead. God forbid I want the light speed dash to work and go along the line of rings clearly designed for it. No, no, you're right, game. I wanted to get that single ring and drop back down. Definitely didn't want to go along the rest of the trail. And don't even get me started on the fucking homing attack, man. Sometimes it is the most precise thing ever, leading you to chain attacks over pits all the time. Or it can just ignore enemies altogether and just send you sailing into a pit. Cool. But it's not like the overall missions can make up for shitty physics and interactions. While each stage is properly unique, they did still try to retrofit the optional missions in to fit. In some instances, these missions just blatantly do not fit the gameplay style of these characters. 100 ring challenges fucking suck! Oh god, I'm glad I could finally say it. Holy shit, I have been roiling over here just waiting to talk about these fucking stages. Tails and Eggman, by design, have health bars to make their stages just a little bit more tactical. It's not like the speed or hunting stages where holding onto at least one ring keeps you alive. If your health hits zero, regardless of how many rings you had, that's a loss of a life. Because of that, while it's possible to get through levels without taking any damage, it's highly likely, and intentional, that you'll get hit by something when you sight read a level. So. Imagine combining that gameplay style with a mission type that requires you to not get hit for significant portions. 100 ring missions generally work okay for speed characters and are annoying at best for hunt stages. But for Tails and Eggman, it is fundamentally broken and frustrating expecting the player to play nearly flawlessly in stages that were never really designed for it. Heading on to that, the mech stages generally have just enough rings to collect in the time limit required to get an A rank. In some cases, it requires you to get extremely deep into a stage, sometimes near the very end. I know two minutes doesn't seem like a very long time, but when it's two minutes ambling around in these giant toddler carriages on stilts, it starts to make the old uh, gray matter dissolve. Certainly it doesn't help when the lock-on system just decides it doesn't want to fucking work. These graphics card enemies must have the hitbox of a goddamn P because reliably hitting them, even with a speed character using the homing attack, is a goddamn nightmare and a half. In most stages, namely the normal, timed, and hard mode, A rank is determined by your score. And for the mech stages, that generally means running and gunning the whole time, holding down the tinnitus beam and losing your hearing over time and chaining as many combos as you can while praying to fucking god nothing doesn't hit you with a stray bullet while you're trying to chain your combo but score is probably the easiest in the mech stages speed stages on the other hand are a goddamn pain in the ass you'll just be cruising through the stage thinking you're doing great getting to the end in a decent amount of time only to get a c and I understand it's to try and make you go back through the stage, look for different routes to get more points, but all it does is make me realize how strict the point system really is. Of course, nothing compares to the scoring system of the treasure hunters. Imagine, if you will, that you're back in school and it's time for a field day. Everyone's all excited, there's gonna be a bunch of games and you wanna find out what the first one is. So your teacher tells you you're gonna have a scavenger hunt. You gotta find some specific items and bring them all back for a prize. Sounds like a fun time, you can't wait to figure out where they're all at. Only, your teacher says go and expects you to go find these items without telling you what they are in the time limit. That's what the treasure hunting A ranks are. Good luck, bucko, don't get lost. Ugh, I fucked it up. Good luck, bucko, don't get lost down a goddamn storm drain. Score in treasure hunt stages is determined by how fast you can find a treasure and how many clues it took for you to get there. In some stages, it's not too terrible. Smaller stages like Dry Lagoon or Aquatic Mine makes it easy to get around the stages quick enough. But the bullshit sets in when stages inevitably become larger and more complex. 
While being able to sense only one treasure helps keep the search more focused, it becomes a burden whenever you try to go for the A ranks. While there are a set number of locations that treasure can spawn, it gets randomized every time you start the stage. And even using the example of a smaller one like Wild Canyon, there are still 56 total spots a treasure can be. So while getting A ranks at the earlier, smaller stages aren't as bad, when you get to levels like Mad Space that have over 100 different treasure locations, all randomized, getting A ranks in a remotely decent amount of time becomes a second job. It's why these missions only ever feel like they've been tuned for speed stages. For hunting in mech stages, most of the missions don't really fit. Are you really going to tell me that the 100 rank challenge on Pyramid Base feels like it was tuned to be an engaging challenge? There's not enough rings in the open area of the stage, meaning that you have to know that this little hidden pocket of ring capsules is hidden here. And while you might argue, oh, that's an intuitive way to make the player engage with the level design, uh, I'd argue that it's stupid and dumb, so I, I win. You look me in the eye and tell me there's a god when you have to get around the chaos experiments without getting hit. But okay, if the rest of the game is generally fun to play, you can probably just excuse some of the bullshit mission design, right? Something... something rough transition to 3D. While each style controls well enough to get you through stages, trying to find shortcuts or skip terrain makes the game start throwing tantrums. Hit detection for a lot of stage obstacles is a complete gamble whether or not you'll land. The amount of times I've somehow thread the needle trying to land on grind rails right next to each other was astronomically high. Meanwhile, each mech character feels like they're one step away from having tank controls. I understand that it feels more realistic for whatever that matters, since their fuck turning radius makes them feel a lot heavier, but it makes avoiding attacks an unnecessary difficulty, not to mention slipping off of platforms constantly. You know, for two geniuses, you'd think that they'd find a way to get around on their mechs faster than just sliding the underside of their mech feet with, like, bacon grease. There's like a combined 3 million IQ between the two of them. You'd think they'd come up with one robot with a decent turning radius. What are the Elon Musk? Knuckles and Rouge have this weird in-between of being a speed character and partly a mech character. They go shockingly fast compared to the mechs, but sometimes have an incredibly hard time positioning themselves right where you want them to be. Considering their abilities require them to be precise, it can be incredibly difficult to land on a small platform or climb to the correct part of a wall. Look at me. You look at your screen right now. I know you're tabbed out like playing a game or doing something else. You look at this echidna standing on this spire like a Final Fantasy Dragoon, and you tell me that this looks like it was fun to do. You press the stick in the wrong direction for one second and whoop, back down you go. Nine times out of 10, that fall is enough to ruin the A rank and you have to start the whole level over again. Also, they put this fucking flying enemy here, positioned perfectly to keep shooting you off this spire. This game fucking sucks. Between the mech and treasure hunt characters, issues with terrain collision really start to show. Adventure 1 had this issue as well, where touching terrain while you're moving would destroy your forward momentum. And while it's not exactly the same as the speed characters can get around this, the terrain does some fucky things with the others. Have you ever wanted to be gliding and you just accidentally nudge into one of the railings and fucking send yourself skyrocketing downwards? For some reason, as the mech characters, when you're gliding and you touch one of the walls, it like tries to magnetize you down to the floor. 90% of the time, that's not gonna be a bad thing if you don't like royally fuck up a jump. But if you're trying to speed run a stage like, oh, I don't know, a certain mission wants you to do, it feels royally unfair to be going at a really decent pace, trying to skip some annoyingly slow obstacle, only for the game to just kick you down a pit like your name was Mufasa. Also, completely fucked up that if you hit the spring as one of the treasure hunters, it doesn't count as your first jump, but also doesn't let you jump afterwards. So if you wanted to glide to, oh, I don't know, get an emerald on hard mode that's just floating in the middle of fucking nowhere, you have to mash the jump button quick to make it think you've jumped midair, then again to glide. Here, take a listen. You can hear in the audio the first jump going off before I can properly glide here. Just don't uh, mash the jump button too many times in a row, because then it'll cancel your jump and send you soaring back to the floor, likely costing you the A rank as well. Not that, uh, not, not, not that that happened to me a lot of times. Not like the 
fucked gliding and jumping mechanics in the hunt stages ruined my psyche, poisoned my water supply, and fucked my wife. I spent like a week straight collecting emblems just to have a breakdown on camera. I love Sonic Adventure 2. It's a phenomenally fun game that, despite some of the annoying design, kept making me want to complete it. But even despite that love, I can't ignore how that piling up of annoyances and inconvenience changed my view of the game. Is the reward for getting 180 emblems worth going through the frustrating forced missions? Is it something that justifies wrestling with obnoxious physics and baffling controls at times? I suppose for it being the first time I've ever earned them all, I don't regret the grind and perseverance it took. I'm proud that I had the determination and skill to get to the end, so I suppose it feels earned. But as I booted up Green Hill for the first time in my entire life, ran through the level a few times to attempt one final A rank, I realized that this was it. This was my reward, to play more of a game, to continue to wrestle with the camera, with the occasionally wonky gameplay on a level that felt like it was more like a tech demo than a proper victory lap. Genuinely, I had a great time, I'm not lying about that. I still look back fondly on completing all these stages and giving this game my all. But I can't deny that I've already kind of written this off as something I'll never do again. Will I come back and play the story or go back through and play some of the stages that I really love? Absolutely. But I can't say I would ever go through the whole trouble of 100%ing it again. I think that's part of the legacy that Sonic Adventure 2 would push forward to the rest of the franchise. The feeling of compounding small game annoyances mixed with frustrating, repetitive, Bad shit completion requirements. Like, the idea of completing all four stories in Sonic Heroes, going through the same stages over and over again, having to get all seven Chaos Emeralds just to finish the story. Are you seriously going to tell me that getting all ten endings in Shadow the Hedgehog is good design? It's a grind and a half for the barest of bare minimums, and an absurdly high ceiling if you wanted to do it all. This was the first game, as far as I could find, that had the ranking system, and for better or for worse, it would go on to many of the mainline series going forward. But you might be thinking to yourself, hang on, isn't there something he's forgotten? Something else required to unlock the 100% reward besides getting all A ranks on every single mission? And you'd be right, outside of the kart racing and boss rush, which I mean, it's barely worth mentioning, it's just side modes adapted from the main game. Now there's something else missing, something that would perhaps go on to define both the adventure game's legacies far more than any story or level. Here my friend, take this key, you've got some gardening to do. Hold on tight, you're going to be there for a long, long time. Hey, we take those. Let me tell you a little story. A story of victory, defeat, and overcoming insurmountable odds. Once upon a time, there was a little garden nestled away at the edge of existence. The garden was peaceful, beautiful, having long waited for the right one to enter its grassy bosom. In this garden sat two eggs, pristine and patient, hoping one day to be hatched to someone who might care for them. And one day, that person came to change the course of the garden and those eggs forever. Inside one egg sat our hero, waiting ever so patiently to be hatched. With a devious grin on his face, the chow known as Star would break from his confines, ready to take on the whole world. Star, much like their new caretaker, had only one goal in their little jiggle physics brain. To reach the pinnacle of the chow world with their heads held high, having proven themselves the strongest in the land. Oh, and uh, the, the other egg hatched too, but uh, we, we don't give them a name. They're like a side character in the story. Uh, the caretaker gave them like a bunch of skunks to be like a joke because they're going to be the stinky one with no name and no legacy. That's just no name. We don't talk about no name. This story is about Star and they're skyrocketing to fame and glory. They had a smile on their face and a fire in their heart ready to take on every day after. 
So, Star's training began, with their new caretaker coming and going at random intervals, always returning with a collection of small, defenseless animals and strange, glowing vials. Star was always told that these vials contained new and upcoming flavors of something called Mountain Dew, and eventually gained an addiction, glass container and all, feeling their muscles and brain grow stronger by the minute. Their body contorted and morphed dozens of times during their growth, spurred on by the many adorable creatures their caretaker ripped from the safety of their natural habitats. In time, the caretaker would return more and more frequently, a few minutes at a time with armfuls of Mountain Dew. Like, 10 at a time every couple of minutes, it was really fucked up. Why would the caretaker do this? This seems cruel and unusual. Supposedly it would make a star stronger, but it all felt like a pointless, annoying grind to finish off a checklist. Still, Star felt stronger and stronger with every vial of Mountain Dew they drank. Meanwhile, No Name just lazed about, doing nothing being an absolute waste. They would never live up to the legacy of their sibling Star, and they might as well have crawled back into the egg. Soon, the day came where Star would finally enter the world of Chow competition. With a cocky grin on their face and determination in their eyes, they would take on all challengers. Though, perhaps they were a little too cocky considering their first opponents were literal babies and Star was the only one able to walk. But that didn't matter to Star. These babies were but stepping stones in their ascension, their path to absolute domination. Though they swam and ran and climbed valiantly, Star had quickly found themselves trailing behind in the competition. Despite all the kegs of Mountain Dew they chugged and all the ripped animal appendages, they had already found their first major hurdle so soon into their attempt at glory. Of course, there were many routes the caretaker could have gone to make them even stronger than the competition. They could go back into the mines and grind out the start of Prison Lane again, over and over and over and over and over, getting 10 capsules of Mountain Dew for hours on end. It had gotten them this far in the time that the caretakers spent. Or they could have bred a new competitor to take Star's legacy forward, but that would have taken far, far longer than the Dew Mines. So what was there to do? Would the caretaker bite the bullet and grind out the necessary dr I mean, Mountain Dew? Would they try to follow all those insane chow breeding guides? No. No, instead they found an even greater path. One that their forerunners employed in the most dire of circumstances. In a matter of seconds, Star felt their body ascend and change, reaching new levels of strength once thought impossible. Oh fuck! Oh god, he's hideous! Oh god, he's a literal shit! Oh my god, he's a literal shithead! Oh fuck, god, go back! <clears throat> Excuse me, I got uh, a little carried away there. With their new godly perfect body, they returned to the Colosseum, prepared to defeat any who stood in their way. One by one, the competition fell, left in star's dust in repetitive track after repetitive track. No matter what trophy he sought, Star could not be defeated. Even if he tripped, even if his luck was impossible to properly determine, Victory after victory, emblem after emblem, Star began to fulfill their dream, becoming the greatest Chow champion. Though just when they began to reach their peak, fate would have different plans. But there was one competition that Star could not challenge. He had grown into a dark Chow, a devious creature that would do anything to win. But because of that, he was barred from the hero races. And from there, it felt as if Star and the caretaker's efforts would all be for naught. But when everything was at its bleakest moment, a new hero would rise from the wings. While Star had been training and competing, being the caretakers favored, No Name honed their skills in private. 
Soon they would surpass even Star's peak, entering the hero challenges and taking on the literal devil. With no hesitation, they swept the competition. With a victory lap, they would enter the Chow Karate competition and sweep every challenger off their feet, coming out with every emblem unbeaten. And so, on this day, we salute our brave hero, once a stinky no-name baby, earning his true heroic name, Champ. All right, story time over, and I gotta come out and say it bluntly. The Chow Garden is just not a mode for me, and I don't think it ever has been. And before I get raked over the coals for saying that, I'm not saying it's a bad game mode. There's a reason why so many people have insane nostalgia for the Chow Garden in both Adventure 1 and 2. But for me, it's always felt like too much of an annoying grind with very little input. The Chow Garden has created a legacy of its own entirely separate from Sonic. For many, I think, Chow Garden is the main appeal of the game, of raising and breeding your own little guys and ignoring the rest. I've talked to countless people through the years who have spent hundreds of hours just sitting in the garden making a bunch of little freaks. Hell, some of them still have those same Chow on a memory card somewhere in their closet. And nothing I should say should take away from that feeling, because there is a high quality game here. The Chow Garden has become almost synonymous with the Adventure series, and the Chow themselves have become integral to the Sonic universe, even if in recent years they've been replaced by uh, Lucky Charms aliens. I, look, I, I like Wisps, but I feel like we've lost some of the culture here, like... We used to be a community. We used to have little guys that we would raise on our own, and now we just have... Sperm. A lot of my criticism with the Chow Garden, in Adventure 2 specifically, is that it's always felt like it doesn't mesh with the rest of the game. If you seriously want to focus on raising a Chow, it takes a lot of unrewarding grinding. Only being able to have 10 items stored before you run out of slots is limiting, which leads to a lot of just spamming the same level over and over again. For those that don't know, robotic enemies drop thing called Chaos Cores, aka the Mountain Dew. Between those and the random animals you can find, you can only hold 10 items at a time to bring back to the garden per character. But you're gonna collect 10 very, very quickly if you pick up everything, which obviously isn't very efficient. I don't know if it would've been possible back in the day, either with the technology on hand or the size of the development team, but maybe making something like collective bars or tanks for each core type. Make it so that the animals fill up the inventory bar, but you can collect a lot more of the cores in like different storage vats or beer kegs or something that you can make the babies drink. Even then, raising Chow stats is, like, insanely obtuse. Finding out what kind of Chow you already have, finding out which stats you want to raise, finding out that there's hidden stats that the game doesn't tell you. There's a point where a lack of hand-holding is intentional, and when it starts to feel malicious. And combined with the lack of synergy with the main game, it just feels like conflicting ideas making the whole package a little worse. I understand that they wanted to give the Chow their own autonomy, and, and, I, and I love them for that. But you can't sit there and tell me that it feels fun or intuitive just trying to force feed your Chow like mangoes so that they can raise their stamina levels. It, it, it's not fun. Come on. Just, just eat the mango. Please. Please. Please just eat the fucking mango. You need the stamina. Eat the fucking mango. Shout out to Fusion's Chow Editor for getting rid of the grind, but it's not like it makes the races themselves any more interesting. While the stats help Chow get through the stages easier, the lack of interaction you have makes it almost a 3 hour plus affair just to let them play out on their own. I don't know how you'd get around this without fundamentally changing overall and how many levels they had for the Chow to go through. You'll end up seeing the same exact turns, the same exact jumps, the same exact race over and over, Possibly with newer technology and design, you could add some more randomized elements to the track and make sure that you're trained for every possible outcome. Even then, I think that would open up even more issues, taking away the fun of creating different Chow specifically good at certain events. I mean, people already go for an all S rank Chow to begin with, but I still think it takes away some of the diversity there. Do not fucking shotgun all the races and karate matches back to back. 
I have had the chow music stuck in my head for weeks now. I left a part of myself back in that garden. I, I will never get it back. For years, people have wanted more Chow Garden content, and it's crazy that Sega hasn't capitalized on it. If you were to make a whole game based around raising Chow, you could properly balance the raising aspects with the competitions. I think the perfect inspiration for future gardens is the Monster Rancher series, a series all about raising one or two little guys at a time. Using Monster Rancher as an inspiration would remove a lot of the randomness and fix problems with tying it back to the base game. You could purposely spend time targeting what skills you want without having to hope that you got the right chaos cores or animals. Uh, side note, Sega, fuck you for making two of the cores similar colors. Yes, I know that's me just ranting about the colorblindness thing, uh, no one else is gonna have that problem, but I still genuinely can't tell the difference between the speed and swim cores. There's been whispers for a long time about a mobile port or adaptation of the Chow Garden in some way or another, and I think that's the perfect place for it. The low commitment but long engagement is perfect for the type of platform where you can just pick it up and put it down whenever you need to or whenever you're just, I don't know, taking a shit or something. I mean, they'd, they'd eventually like sell microtransactions and, and sell extra eggs to you on a store, but hey, at least you'd have your own little shithead freak on your phone, so I mean, that's nice. The Chow Garden is undeniably a staple of the adventure games and helped define their place in Sonic's overall legacy. Adventure 2 wouldn't be the same game it is today without those memories of the time spent in the garden. And while it's not something that I personally enjoy, the way thousands of people look back fondly on it shows that it means something to a lot of people. But with that, I've really got nothing left to say. I've got all the emblems, my little champions are all grown up, and I think it's time to end this adventure. Come on. Get out of here. <laughs> the adventure games hold a special place in my heart. When I think of Sonic, when I think the epitome or the peak of the series, I can't help but think of them. They're the games that helped establish the modern aesthetics of what Sonic would be known for. They're the games that would help characterize the cast to how they'd be seen today. And for that, they'll always be some of my favorite games of all time. Playing Adventure 2 reminded me exactly why I love it. All the nostalgia that I'd remembered from playing the story countless times. All the levels that I'd replay and stories that I'd make up about why the characters were there. From the casual perspective, playing through the base versions of these iconic stages, it might well be one of Sonic's best 3D outings. Of course, that's up to perspective, but I think there's a reason why so many love it even today. I mean, Shadow alone is enough of a reason for this game to be remembered. A character so beloved they would bring him back to life one game later. And some would say that kind of cheapens the impact of his story, while I say that gave us the undeniably badass intro for his solo game. That is an official Sonic AMV, and you know what? Good for them. Good for them for leaning into the cringe culture before it became mainstream. But playing Adventure 2, and I mean really playing it thoroughly like this for the first time, I realize why I never hear of many people who have earned all 180 emblems. You'll always find people who talk about how sick this game is, how amazing some of the levels are, how cool Shadow is, but I always wonder why no one ever talks about the whole of the game outside of the usual, oh you don't want to do that type comments. For a long time, I'd always ask people about the 100% reward, if they'd gotten Green Hill, if they'd done everything in the game, and they'd just kind of look at me like I'd ask them about a war. Their eyes would glaze over, they'd look past me and just kind of get lost in their memories. Don't do it, they'd say. It's not worth it. Fuck bad space, or something to that degree. Or maybe that's just me. I think I'm already starting to get the thousand yard stare. But I think I understand why no one ever really talks about the whole game. And that's because it was never really part of the experience for them. For many people, they just pick up the game, play through as much of the funny story as they can, and then they move on. They'd see the weirdly mo-capped cutscenes, they'd hear the strange audio mixing, they'd defeat the bio-lizard, and then they'd move on with their life. And for most people, I think that's a perfect place to leave it. That is a legacy that is worth keeping, a game that is remembered for just being fun. But from a series perspective, knowing how the games would eventually evolve, it's hard to ignore what this game did. 
It would cement the staple of shockingly serious and intricate stories. It would bring forth gameplay and systems that persist to this day like the ranking system, like the instant light speed dash, held the entire concept of Sonic grinding on rails. So much of the series' mechanics and identity can be tied back directly to Adventure 2. While the callbacks to previous zones like Green Hill would become tedious fan service, this is where it all started. This once playground legend that you could unlock a 3D version of the very first Sonic level ever was such a cool thing to hear. Seeing it in magazines, of finding videos of it, it felt like a holy grail. But then they just keep doing it, finding ways to bring back previous Sonic aesthetics, motifs, direct nostalgia for the sake of trying to please the audience. Generations was great, but we don't need every game to have a Green Hill equivalent at the start. But that's what Adventure 2 was. It was the trendsetter. It was the miracle game that would define people's childhood and entire franchise's future. How many times have you seen people ask, well, where's Sonic Adventure 3? Towards like, any new Sonic project coming out. Even 20 years later, people are still continually asking for a follow-up in the same exact spirit as what they knew as a kid. And having gone through it all, I, I have to ask, is that really what you want? Do you really want a game with 180 emblems stuck behind frustrating mission design? Do you really want more games to come out being rush jobs from a wholly understaffed dev team? I love this game as much as the community does, it's one of my favorite games ever, but look at what chasing that high of the adventure games has done to the franchise. Insane and often incoherent storytelling between Sonic Heroes, Shadow the Hedgehog, Sonic 06, hell, bringing Shadow back at all due to the overwhelming majority of people that wanted him back into the franchise, and in many ways, trying again and again to make a new adventure game that would never meet the community's lofty expectations. Sonic Team did make multiple different attempts at a Sonic Adventure 3, even if it was never accepted. Like it or not, Sonic 06 has all the DNA of an adventure game in its code somewhere, even if it's morphed into a total abomination. That's a whole story of trying to chase an expectation and expecting understaffed and undersupported devs to deliver. But if you look at the core of what they were trying to do, that's Adventure 3. But of course, Sonic 06 is a bad game, so no one wants to remotely look at that as the follow-up to the near masterpiece of the second outing. But when Sega attempts to do something a little different, change up the gameplay formula just enough to make something new, it often gets looked at as not good enough. Sonic Unleashed also has much of the DNA of an adventure game, with open worlds, multiple stages and missions per zone, split between two different gameplay styles. And I know that people hate when you try to bring this into it, but the Japanese title is Sonic World Adventure. But oh, it doesn't play anything like the Adventure series, so it doesn't count as a successor to the formula. I'm ranting a little at this point, and I sound like I'm defending these games, or attacking the community mindset, or defending Sega, and I'm really not trying to do any of that. This was just the train of thought I started to follow when I really asked myself, what is the legacy that Adventure 2 left behind? And I think I've finally come up with an answer. Adventure 2 is a game that many people love. It is insanely fun, even if it's marred by a bloated post-game, if you even want to call it that. It has an identity crisis strewn between a bunch of different gameplay styles, the chow garden, kart racing, all of that, but it's been propped up as this messiah, this pedestal that no other Sonic game can reach if it's not a direct, perfect continuation. Sonic Adventure 2's legacy is being a monolith, a standard to which nothing can ever really meet, because no one really knows what that standard is, it's become this juggernaut, casting a huge shadow, pun somewhat intended, over the rest of the franchise that puts scrutiny on every single project that comes out after it. On one hand, there's a comparison every Sonic game gets now, whether it's better or worse than Sonic 06. This idea that even if a game has flaws, it's redeemed by saying, oh, at least it's not 06, or something like that. But there's another goalpost, and there has been one for a long time, it's fine, but it's not Adventure 2. And it's totally fine to compare games in the same series to one another, but sometimes you really have to ask yourself what you're comparing. Do you say it because you genuinely love it? Do you say it because you remember it being your favorite? Or do you simply say it because you want it to reach that same feeling you had when you were a kid? There's nothing inherently wrong with any of these answers. Everyone's going to have different reasons for why they find reverence in any single game. 
But I think there are times when we have to take a step back and really ask ourselves what we are asking for. What do we really want a follow-up to look like? Or are we just asking for the same game but again because that's what we're comfortable with? Sonic Adventure 3, if it ever releases in any real way, will never live up to the expectations set onto it. But I think that's okay too. I don't want a game to just be another version of the one I already played. I want something new. I want to see how my favorite series evolves and develops new ideas. And sometimes that's scary, trying something new or letting yourself evolve past something we hold into our nostalgia. Trying something new is what got us Adventure 2 in the first place, and I hope that Sonic Team keeps trying new things, especially if they ever try to make a proper Adventure 3. But please, Sega, I, I, am, I am begging you. Give Sonic Team more budget than just two paper clips and a used condom. I, I am begging you. <laughs>